This here is the two-disc special edition DVD of what is arguably the greatest martial arts film of all time. I got mine on a special two-for-two two deal along with Unforgiven, but even finding it by itself, you can usually get it for a good price, and it is well fucking worth it. But if you're too cheap to pick that up, you could always go with the Super Kung Fu box set, which is significantly cheaper and doesn't just contain one movie, it contains ten. So you know they're gonna be good. Or are they? Okay, well I'm not gonna review all ten of these fucking movies, but maybe over time I'll get to some more. But right now though, we're gonna take a look at one in particular called Ninja Untouchables. At least that's what the box cover wants us to think it's called. It took me so fucking long to do some background research on this fucking thing, because if you type in Ninja Untouchables on IMDb, nothing will come up. It's an alternate title that is not even official enough for the internet fucking movie database. I located it by doing an actor search, and come to find out it's actually called Untouchable Glory. So why the name change to Ninja Untouchables? I have no fucking clue, because the opening credits still say Untouchable Glory, but they went ahead and added Ninja Untouchables to another part of the screen. Seriously, they didn't even get another fucking title card. They might as well have just put a giant X through the original title. Well, apparently this is part two of the American Force series of movies, but, I mean, this movie has so many goddamn alternate titles that, who knows, this could be as official of a sequel as Caligula 3. There's not a whole lot to say about the plot of the movie, but is, it re is that really all that surprising? The evil General Karpov wants to build a military base in Indonesia, which quite upsets the local townspeople, so much so that they form their own rebellion to go against Karpov. But that isn't quite enough, which is why Agent Brian O'Reilly is enlisted to help their cause by killing even more of Karpov's men. O'Reilly is helped by his trusty Asian sidekick named White Tiger. The stuff with the Rebellion Untouchables is honestly a little hard to follow, and it really shouldn't be, but maybe it's just because I was really fucking bored during those scenes. I mean, what's hard to figure out, really? It should be easy to get Karpov's men. They pull a knife, you pull a gun. He sends one of yours to the hospital, you send one of his to the morgue. That's the Indonesian way, and that's how you get Karpov. But maybe all of this seems hard to follow because it looks like every Brian O'Reilly scene is from a different movie. I mean, who is Brian O'Reilly exactly? He's the best in his field. A special agent from America. Still, I mean, it looks like they just randomly shot some Brian O'Reilly footage and spliced it right there in the movie to make it appeal to a wider audience. I mean... Why is he making things so difficult for everyone in the movie? He doesn't do all that much, and he doesn't really interact with anyone else from the plot. Sometimes we see him sitting down where somebody explains to him what is going on in the movie, and later we'll just randomly cut to him running somewhere, and he kicks someone's ass or shoots them. But still, why would they send just one guy after them? Because that one man can do more damage alone than 20 men together. Simply put, he's the best. Maybe so, but it is just one fucking guy, so just get rid of him! Good idea. Of course we have to get rid of him, idiot! I may be wrong about this, but I don't think that the character Brian O'Reilly was originally intended for Ninja Untouchables. I mean, imagine if they took... Blood Diamond and spliced in Jean-Claude Van Damme. This movie is so goddamn schizo that I would rather date a bipolar manic depressive. Again. As you may have noticed, uh, one thing I cannot get over in this thing is the dubbing. I've seen bad dubbing before, 
many times, but this time it is so bad that I don't think it's intended to be, I mean, serious at all. It almost looks like they intentionally made this fucking thing really bad. And it's because of the bad dubbing that I almost think that this is supposed to be some kind of satire on standard action fare, but that's really giving it a lot more credit than it deserves. Here, I, I, I gotta play some more of the dubbing. I mean, nobody can be this bad of a dub actor unintentionally. We, we gotta listen to some more of General Karpov. Don't give me that shit. If he's a nobody, how can you explain what happened to him? Now, locate them and finish the fucking untouchables once and for all. I'll do that, General. Good. It doesn't even stop there. I mean, the dubbing sounds fucking ridiculous, even when somebody just simply gets shot. Okay, so just think of Ninja Untouchables as the absolute stereotype of every by-the-numbers, explosion-heavy 80s action film ever made. This thing, it looks like a fucking prototype. A bad prototype. This makes Rambo 3 look like Day of the Jackal. You've seen movies and sketch comedy shows before where they'll spoof the by-the-numbers 80s action movies with uh, with the bulletproof heroes, the the mannequins, the fucking one-liners, and the stock villains. That is this movie. You are not going to find a more stereotypical 80s action movie than this one. This movie is so stereotypical to the genre that it belongs in like an 80s action movie minstrel show. I mean, look at this. After one fight scene, the two heroes actually shake hands afterwards. I, I really need to know if this movie is supposed to be some kind of lampoon. Okay, so you probably want some one-liners from this movie. Alright, well, I'll give you some. I'll give you the two most memorable, and simultaneously the two worst. They come at the beginning and at the end of a fight scene, so I'll include that too, because it's pretty fucking ridiculous. So, here it is. <laughs> you don't look so tough to me. Don't judge a book by its cover. You'll be needing some weapons. Hmm. What a useless guy. Yes. Useless guy indeed. Uh -huh. Why the fuck am I reviewing this movie? I mean, I feel like my playlist got mixed up with the VHS show, which is a great show, by the way, but I'm half expecting to, like, flip over there and see him reviewing Demons 3, The Ogre. I mean... I mean, well, this this movie, it's it's on DVD, so I guess I'm reviewing the right movie, which sucks for me, because I had to watch the whole fucking thing. But I have turned into such a masochist that I... I've got to find out if there's any more Brian O'Reilly movies. In case you're wondering, O'Reilly is played by Eric Bana look-alike Pierre Kirby, who was only in six movies, all of which were made in 1988. I must find these other movies. I will not be taken down by action's exploitation. Brian O'Reilly is a highly decorated Vietnam veteran. After the war, he became a member of the elite American force.
took me a while to come up with the best way to celebrate 50 Cinema Snob Reviews. I could have done something like uh, the 50 greatest images of grain fields as shot by Ingmar Bergman. Or I could have done 50 words which sound better when spoken by Sir Laurence Olivier. But that wouldn't have been in keeping with this prison of insanity that I've created for myself. So that is why I bring you Pierre Kirby Week. Because something that obscure still makes me feel a little pretentious. It's impossible to explain who and what Pierre Kirby is without first talking about this guy. Godfrey Ho. This Hong Kong-based director made over 90 films in his career, 40 of which actually have the word ninja in the titles. Ho became famous for his particular style of editing, which involved the action sequences with one storyline, then splicing them in with footage from other Hong Kong martial arts films that were either unfinished or unreleased. Kind of like removing a day-old log of shit from the toilet and fusing it together with a hanging piece of shit that you pulled straight out of a golden retriever's asshole. This was an interesting way, though, to create several full-length movies with the budget for one movie, even if the resulting products were barely coherent in any way whatsoever. This entire technique is known as the cut-and-paste technique. Here in the States, though, we call it the Olin Ray. Godfrey Ho's footage consisted of using Caucasian actors to appeal to a wider audience. More often than not, this void was filled by none other than Richard Harrison. Harrison acted in footage for several Godfrey Ho movies in the 1980s, but Ho being Ho would take that footage and adapt it to several other movies far beyond the number of films Harrison was willing to take part in. Harrison later stated that the damage done to his career by Godfrey Ho's consistent usage of the Harrison footage is what would lead to his retirement from acting. <laughs> Are you sure it wasn't the Nazi exploitation movie? But not all of these films had an appearance by Richard Harrison in the Caucasian role. Now, now, six of them made in a one-year period of time showcased the fighting talents of a man named Pierre Kirby. Kirby would take top billing for these movies and was the primary hero of the Godfrey Ho segments of these particular films. Fast as shit, rough and tough, and able to spout off tongue-in-cheek one-liners with a smirk directly descended from the action hero god known as Bronsiden, Kirby was the real deal in his fighting skills. But where the fuck did he come from? And where did he go after his six film stint ended? Well, we'll get to that later. After all, we've got a whole week to cover Pierre Kirby. So right now, let's focus on the first film in the Pierre Kirby library. Zombie vs. Ninja. I don't really know if this is actually the first film Pierre Kirby shot footage for, or even if it was the first one to be released. Of course, he could have just filmed a bunch of random fight scenes and then just spliced them into six different movies. Actually, that makes the most sense, but seeing how this movie is listed first on Pierre Kirby's IMDb filmography, let's pretend like this is the first time he stepped in front of the camera. Before the movie even starts, it shows us its trailer. It's almost as if the movie is saying, Really? You really want to watch this movie? Look at the trailer. Seriously, look at it. You think you can handle 90 minutes of this? Well, from a title like Zombie vs. Ninja, you're probably expecting something like this. That's not really what you're getting here. It took me about 45 minutes to realize that these are supposed to be the zombies. Bull to the shit. They look like they're just doing the robot. The zombies in Kung Fu Zombie were creepier than this, and that's just because they look like they were straight out of Kabuki Theater Hell. Best to my knowledge, the plot here follows a young man named Ethan. 
which I'm sure was his name in the original version. Ethan's father is killed, so Ethan sets out on a quest for revenge, which really isn't so much of a quest, because the bulk of the movie has him being trained by an undertaker. Who is this guy? All right, I have decided to tank you in as my apprentice. <gasps> Jesus, I, I don't know what to call this guy. It's like if Mickey Rooney and Peter Sellers morphed together to form an ultimate Asian stereotype hybrid. But listen to his voice again. Hey, welcome, sir. Hello to you. Hello. And you want to buy a coffin? Shut up. Now he just reminds me of Bugs Bunny, and Bugs Bunny nips the nips. You decide. Mainly, he has Ethan walking around carrying a coffin over his back. Okay, who cares if he knows martial arts? He can carry a fucking coffin! He's got the strength of the fucking tall man! Not even Django could carry a coffin. He had to drag the sucker behind him. All I'm saying is that if you can carry a coffin, then odds are you can break a man in half. So later on, Ethan meets up with... Wait, why am I talking about this plot? This is motherfucking Pierre Kirby week. So where the fuck is Pierre Kirby? Ah, there he is. There's our motherfucker. The Pierre Kirby scenes are spliced in every now and then. And the only thing that it has to do with the Ethan Bucktooth Coffin Joe story is every now and then... Kirby and The Undertaker hold conversations by the power of cut and paste editing. You want me to teach him, yeah? It would seem a worthy effort. I have already helped him. As a matter of fact, I've begun already. Oh yeah, they were really talking to each other. Might as well be the Frank Sinatra scenes from Cannonball Run 2. Sorry, things didn't work out the way you planned. You bastard. I'll show you who you're messing with. The Pierre Kirby sequences are pretty straightforward. You have the hero, our man Kirby, and the villain. Sure, the Undertaker scenes have more plot to them, and it ends on the note you'd expect from a kung fu flick like this, but Pierre Kirby will not stand for that kind of ending. That's why we get this added on 80s action exploitation style ending. I told you before, the dragon's fire burns hot. What? What does that even mean? Is he a dragon? And he's angry? He's got the rage of a dragon? Ugh. Well, I've run out of time here, but we've got. Four more Pierre Kirby movies to check out this week, so stay tuned. Stop here. Ethan, I'm gonna take a shit. To start off part two of our week-long celebration of all things Pierre Kirby, I guess we should ask that burning question. What the fuck ever happened to Pierre Kirby? Well, you want to know the honest answer? I haven't the faintest fucking idea, which makes that a prime candidate for this edition of Cinema Snob Mysteries. I've searched all over the internet for information detailing the whereabouts of Pierre Kirby, and here's really all that I could come up with. I do know that there are five Pierre Kirbys living in the United States, so hey, and also, you can find a shit ton of filmographies on Pierre Kirby. And I came across a website containing probably the best info that you're going to find on Pierre Kirby. Cinemanocturna.com did a rather lengthy and informative interview with action guy Paul John Stanners, who was in movies like Soldier Terminators and stuff like that. It's a rather long interview totally worth the read definitely but here's where it gets interesting 
It's when he starts talking about the other Caucasian actors who were in the Godfrey Ho films, and Pierre Kirby's name gets brought up, and here's what he had to say. Around Pierre Kirby, there was lots of speculation. Good-looking, could act, and reasonably good at martial arts. The guy sailed into Hong Kong on a yacht with a few very nice Singaporean ladies in tow. Oh, Pierre! Said he made most of his money delivering yachts between different destinations in Southeast Asia. Pierre went off to deliver a yacht to the Philippines. Never came back. Next, the story circulates that he was attacked by pirates, resisted, and was thrown overboard. It does happen in that region. So six months on, and this guy, Edouan Bursmia, is in the Hyatt Hotel in Hong Kong and spots Pierre in the crowd, shouts to him, guy turns and heads out, never to be seen again. Holy fucking shit. Pierre Kirby should star in that movie. And I need a computer desk. While you're wrapping your brains around that, let's move on to Pierre's second feature, Full Metal Ninja. And if you think this movie is going to consist of ninja instructors threatening to skull-fuck protégés while Vietnamese whores hump their legs while dodging snipers, well then stick with that movie in your head, because none of that is in this film. <laughs> The full metal ninja in question here is Eagle, although it could also be referring to Leon, played by Pierre Kirby, because this is two fucking movies spliced together. Seeing how Eagle takes up a majority of the screen time, I'm going to say that he plays the full metal ninja. I'm guessing the full metal is in regards to his sword, since he doesn't carry a fucking rifle with him. But then again, Pierre Kirby has a gun. An old-timey gun, too. You know, because since movie A is in the 17 or 1800s, movie B had to really nail home the point that it is also taking place in the same time frame. Scary-looking thing, isn't it? <laughs> huh? Uh -huh. Bullets are expensive and hard to come by. Consider yourself lucky. Goodbye, Luther. <laughs> Oh my ass, it's 200 years ago. Is that the same time in history when ninjas wore bright fucking pink and bandanas with the word ninja written across them? Because if there's one thing we know about ninjas, it's their bright colors and their knack for self-advertisement. Then again, this movie is about as accurate in its portrayal of ninjas as it is in its portrayal of Buddhists. But it's not right to kill, and that even you must know. Ha! Don't give me that Buddha shit! How dare you say that? Get him! Hey! Goddamn fucking anarchistic Buddhists. There isn't a whole lot to say about the plot. Eagle's family was murdered, so he sets out on a quest for revenge against the men responsible. And meanwhile, Pierre Kirby turns up along the way to give Eagle some tips via editing. Sorry, I'm so weak. Our destinies are one. The monks said we must work together to purge the evil forces. Kirby has his own mission to attend to, kicking the ass of several other multicolored ninjas who want to steal his gun. That's right, they want to steal his gun. Personally, I would steal his ninja costume, because I would wear that son of a bitch's pajamas every night for the rest of my life. Seeing how the Japanese footage of the movie is clearly taken from some previous unreleased film, you almost have to wonder what that movie in itself was like. Did it even have the same plot? Because something tells me it sure as shit didn't have the same dialogue. Sorry if I offended you, asshole. No way. Son of a bitch, why don't you fight like a man? Yeah, asshole. Fucking cocksucker motherfucker, looking for the douchebags who killed your pussy family, huh? Good luck with that chump dick ass fucker. Maybe they did talk like that. Between this and Zombie vs. Ninja, one thing I've noticed is that the added Godfrey Ho footage 
corrupt as it may be, is a lot more interesting than the Japanese film that they've added to. In this particular case, I don't care what's going on in the Eagle story. It is incoherent, confusing, the action is dull, and the acting is just flat and stiff. The added Pierre Kirby scenes are a lot more well made, honestly, and they use niftier slow motion effects, and the martial arts involved are rather impressive. It's also simpler. Pierre Kirby is a ninja who wanders through the eternal forest, kicking mass amounts of ass. Well, I got a message for him. Tell him the judge is here. Fuck you! <laughs> To call these films Z-grade trash cinema is an insult to a film reel featuring a log of shit shaped like a Z that's literally found in a trash can. Look at this. For the scenes where Pierre Kirby is talking to Eagle and Eagle isn't in the woods, they simply just put in a dark backdrop behind Pierre Kirby. I've read a lot of reviews where they talk about how the Godfrey Ho Caucasian footage ruined the likes of Full Metal Ninja. You're gonna die. I'm sorry, you know what? An uninteresting martial arts film needs the addition of Pink Ninjas. I'm really not in the mood for multi-colored ninjas, buck-tooth masters, and guns with only one bullet. Well, lucky for that, the third movie in our Pierre Kirby week is Thunder of the Gigantic Serpent. And just to be clear, this isn't one of those smart-ass titles like Day of the Panther, where it's like, Oh no, it's a giant panther, he's loose in the city, killing people all in one day. Oh wait, it's just about a guy who calls himself the panther and uh, he kicks the shit out of people. Fuck that, Thunder of the Gigantic Serpent is literally about a gigantic serpent. And there's thunder in it! Finally, a big title that actually explains the movie. Fuck you, Iguana with the Tongue of Fire. Actually, this is the fourth in the Pierre Kirby series of films. I skipped his second one, which was Ninja Untouchables, because it was previously reviewed on this show in January of 2008. That's over a year ago. I don't remember dick about that movie, except that Pierre Kirby played Brian O'Reilly, who sometimes liked to work alone unless accompanied by White Tiger. We'll get to his role in Gigantic Serpent here in a second, but first, let's talk about the actual movie. I've now seen Godfrey Ho do his cut-and-paste treatment on actions, exploitation flicks, and hordes of ninja movies, but here, we have something a little bit different. The Godfrey Ho treatment of a Japanese monster movie, and a really fucking weird one at that. Seriously, you could take out the odd Godfrey Ho segments, and this movie would still be weird. Scientists create a formula that I, I believe the only purpose is to make animals bigger. No, not, not cows or chickens, but they use a frog. Apparently, they do not remember the tagline for frogs, which read, Today the Pond, Tomorrow the World. But that's a different movie, thank Christ. When a group of militants are determined to steal the formula, the box winds up in the hands of a little Asian girl who uses it as a home for her pet snake. I spent the entire movie trying to figure out what this fucking snake's name is. And yeah, the little girl, she says the snake's name. Too bad I can't fucking understand what she's saying. Oh, Charlie. That's not good. Makes you sound like a boy. Hey, I know. I'll call you Mazla. Do you like that? Mazla? Is that it? Mazla? You should have stuck with fucking Charlie. But apparently this little girl hates the fucking audience. <laughs> I have issues with this pet snake anyway. Look at it before it even comes in contact with the box. It understands fucking English. You have to stay here from now on. Do you like it? Or dubbed English at least. Bottom line, 
it understands English. After the snake goes inside the box, it becomes gigantic, which apparently is every little Asian girl's dream come true. Wow, you know what's amazing? Mazla is clearly a giant Muppet, but earlier in the movie, someone is fooled by a fake snake within the movie. That looks more realistic than Mazla. When the little girl is kidnapped by the militants, she is taken to a high-rise in the middle of the city and held hostage until her parents can produce the formula. And the only one to rescue her is clearly Mazla. I guess because Bulgasari is still busy in North Korea. Honestly, who wouldn't want Mazla to help them out of that sticky situation? After all, it fucking kills anything it comes in contact with! Good lord, I'm still not sure if snakes make good pets, but at least they got your fucking back. There isn't a moment in this movie where this snake looks real. It always looks like a puppet, but I have to be honest, sometimes it really does fucking look like a giant puppet. A lot of the work here is slightly impressive. You know what? This... This isn't a bad monster movie. It has a lot of stuff that you would pretty much expect out of a Japanese monster film. Plane explosions, crying Asian girls, bridge scenes, destruction, and of course there is the Godzilla-like symbolism that clearly Mazla represents the ongoing threat of the giant American penis. But once again, I've forgotten, this is Pierre Kirby week. I'm sorry it slipped my mind again, because usually he's only in about 15 or 20 minutes of these movies. Well, would you believe that all of that shit, little girls playing with snakes, the heartbreaking ending where she loses her pet, and the zany slither stick hilarity is all contained in the same movie as this. Once I get the formula... I will be in control of the world's food production. Think of the power I will have. Ha! Every nation on earth will bow to my will. Hmm. Useless son of a bitch. What happened, boss? He screwed up? Brilliant deduction, Sherlock. He lost a fucking formula. What is this shit doing in this film? Okay, I understand the additions to movies like Ninja Untouchables or Zombie vs. Ninja, but when you add this corny actionsploitation shit to a movie that isn't all that bad, then you get, well, the most fucked up monster movie of all time. I almost hate to say it, as fucking out of place as it is, the Godfrey Ho editions are way more coherent in this movie than in the other films. When it cuts to the Pierre Kirby scenes, I actually know what's going on and how it fits in context with the rest of the movie, which is a huge step up. Okay, so who does Pierre Kirby play? Waiting for the boss? I'm waiting for the boss too. Fuck off, who the hell are you? Fast. Ted Fast. Of course that's his name. Why wouldn't it be? But the big question is, does he work alone? He's a highly trained specialist. And he always works alone. He must be pretty good then. What? No, that's not what that means. That means he's stupid. Really fucking stupid. Ted is on a mission to track down the man in charge of the hunt for the snake formula. The villain's got one of those 80's villain names like Swanson or Solomon or Samson or Slaughter, I can't fucking remember which. It doesn't help either that IMDB decided not to put any fucking character names by the actors. Oh yeah, and there's also the essential scenes where Pierre Kirby lets us know that he too knows what's going on in movie A. Hello? General, this is Ted. You better call out your army fast. That snake is headed your way. Huh? Hmm. All right, I'll do it. Good. You better call out fast. <laughs> He's never seen a single frame of movie A. 
I've noticed this about the Pierre Kirby movies. Since there are always two movies spliced in together to make one, they always have two different endings. Movie A always ends first, and in this case, it's pretty much a downer. No, check that, it is a fucking downer. Little girl crying over the loss of her pet snake who came to save her life. I need a fucking pick-me-up after that. We'll cut to movie B, in which the ending is always Pierre Kirby finishing off that movie's villain after a climatic fight sequence. Sad monster movie ending, Z-Gray trash action ending. Seamless. <laughs> Go on, shoot. Make my take, punk. Wow, I can't believe they stole that line from Vice Squad. Well, since the last scene that we see in these is always the movie B ending, that means they have to add one of those cheap PowerPoint ending title cards to the movie, which are always completely fucking abrupt. <laughs> That is the logo that appears in front of nearly all of the Godfrey Ho movies I've seen. The Star Wars theme placed over someone mimicking the Columbia Pictures logo. Because we all know that Star Wars fucking banked for Columbia. And it doesn't even stop there. I've seen these movies take music from Halloween 2, Indiana Jones, and even Bill Lustig's Maniac. Who the hell lifts music from Maniac? Anyway, in this fourth entry in our Pierre Kirby week, we go back to ninjas. Even though I don't want to fucking go back to those. I feel more ill than if Doc Brown and Marty went back to the alternate 1985. It's just a bad idea. But unfortunately, Pierre Kirby only did one gigantic fucking snake movie, so I'm stuck with ninjas. See? It still says it on their headbands. I've noticed this too. All the good ninjas in these movies simply say the word ninja on their headbands, while the villains' headbands put a dash in between nin and ja. You're gonna make our day when we bring you back to Ross. It's nice to know the only thing separating good and evil in the Ninja Code is the fucking space bar. Pierre Kirby has traded in his pink jumpsuit in this movie for the standard yellow. Do you ever get the feeling that when they shoot all of these movies, they just have a box of jumpsuits and they let the actors have a free-for-all on who gets to wear what suit in which movie? Pierre got pink for Full Metal Ninja, so here he's getting yellow for Ninja of the Magnificence. I'm starting to get the feeling that there were no scene markers for these films. They just used their wardrobe as a way to determine which scenes were getting spliced into which movies. And even that didn't help much. I read a review for this film on ePinions.com, and the reviewer had no idea he was actually reviewing Full Metal Ninja. Boy, I'll bet there's egg on his face. But can you honestly blame him? It's nearly the same fucking movie. I honestly don't know what to talk about here in regards to the non-Pierre Kirby action, because I really don't see what the goddamn point is. It's more or less the same fucking plot as Full Metal Ninja, except in that film, the hero out for revenge had long hair, and in this film, it's fucking shaved. There's also a guy in it who looks an awful lot like Betty from Kung Pao, which makes me hand it to this flick. At least it's cut and spliced by people who have actually seen more than one fucking martial arts movie in their life. And there's a, a little girl in it, too, who, uh... <laughs> 
characters like this are the real fucking villains in these movies. The henchmen and the evil masterminds make life miserable for the hero and those close to the hero, but little screeching girls with voices that sound like they were dubbed by Betty Boop's Snatch make life miserable for me. Evil soars to new heights when it starts affecting me. Fuck this kid. Uncle Lee! Hey, get back! Don't come close. Get away! I don't want you to die, Uncle Lee! Damn it, you get away from here! Go on, you crazy girl! I don't like you! Get away, damn it! Get away from me! I want you to stay with me! I want to stay with you! Get away! No, get away from me! No! Get away! No! But now, having seen five Pierre Kirby movies, we finally have the cliched Z-grade ninja martial arts movie moment of the multiple flips in midair. <laughs> Pierre Kirby, must you never cease to amaze me. Well, at least that's much better editing than earlier in the movie where they tried splicing movie A with movie B and the fucking background changed in between shots. He and Ling aren't smart enough. We can handle him with no problem. And I'll deal with Ferris. What's that? You heard right. Well, if this movie isn't even gonna fucking try, then neither am I. I've got nothing else to say here, except that we have one more Pierre Kirby movie left, so tune in tomorrow for the conclusion of Pierre Kirby Week. <laughs> say this just once. I will not give Judy to anybody! <laughs> Would you mind letting me finish my fucking drink first? Well, here we are. The final day of Pierre Kirby week. And before we get to the actual movie, I've got to point out how much this box cover really tickles me. Look at the size of that fucking gun! I don't know what's funnier. The fact that it doesn't look photoshopped like they really gave this guy the biggest fucking magnum they could find. Or the fact that this guy looks like Keith Coogan. It would be one thing if it was Schwarzenegger or Robocop holding this gun. But this guy? The last movie in our marathon is American Commando 2 Hunting Express. And good luck finding out any information on it. If you go to its IMDB page, there are no user reviews, no express reviews, no one has even rated the fucking thing, and its cast list is only made up of two of the actors. It's almost like I am the only person in the world who has seen this movie. Even the movie itself has a hard time believing that it exists, because it can't even get its fucking title right. Here, it's American Commando. But right here, it's American Commando 2. And on here, it's just Hunting Express. Make up your fucking mind, is it a sequel or not? I'm sure context-wise, it's probably about as big of a sequel as American Force 2. So in this movie, we meet Tony, who instantly falls in love with a lady on the subway. The two of them go out on a date, and things get a little rocky when he discovers her working as a prostitute in a massage parlor. Okay, okay, I know you're a prostitute, and that's a shock, but I can totally explain what I'm doing here in this seedy massage parlor. This part of the movie jumps around back and forth between the girl getting thrown around by her pimp and Tony doing what he can to make sure he and the hooker end up together, even if it involves being stalked and attacked by her evil pimp. So how do you take this risky business, 
meets Chungking Express meets Secret of a Married Man plot and twist it into some action exploitation. Who cares? Point is, Godfrey Ho has done it. <laughs> yeah, there we go. But where the fuck is Pierre Kirby? Where's our hero? You're really naive, Mr. O'Brien. <laughs> Your stupidity is beyond belief. Oh my fucking god. Pierre Kirby is the villain. Bitch. You let him go, didn't you? I went shopping. Shopping? He's the fucking villain. Well, now who in the hell am I supposed to root for in this? What? Really? This guy? I'm supposed to root for the almost keep Coogan guy? Fuck that. Well, the way they've combined both plots is that the Kuganator's girlfriend has been taken away by Pierre Kirby, who deals in a slave trade for beautiful girls. And that's where Tony's love interest has come from. She was given to the pimp by Pierre Kirby, so all while Tony is trying to win over his girl with sweet nothings and love, this guy is winning back his girl with his fucking fist. We see at the beginning that Tony's part in the film is taking place in Japan, while Pierre Kirby's scenes are in Hong Kong. Nice to know they're that specific with the Pierre Kirby scenes. Tony scenes, however, well, they could be anywhere in Japan. Just pick a fucking place. I've got a lot of fucking problems with this movie. Namely, how the dubbing, even for the Caucasians, still sounds like it's being dubbed by an Asian guy. See what I mean? Did she just fucking shoot the ropes off of his hand? This guy sucks. I don't like him one bit. But it does look like Pierre Kirby is having some fun in the villain role. And it's quite a change from the other roles I've seen him play. Yes, boss, he's been to George's girl Clara, too. Who the fuck does he think he is? I want this guy out of commission. You got that? I guess if it's your swan song, you might as well go out with a bang. So here are Pierre Kirby's final moments on film. Honestly, I don't even know if this is the last movie Pierre shot footage for. I'm just going by the order on IMDb, so for all I know, this could actually be the first film Pierre Kirby was ever in. But something tells me this is the last movie he shot footage for. Why? Well, because it seems like the writers are running out of stuff for him to say. I'll probably have more girls for you in a month or two. Well, that'd be nice. But I do know that Pierre Kirby's final scenes piss me off when compared to the ending of the Tony portion of the story. <laughs> so fucking Peach Fuzz gets away with everything, yet Pierre Kirby gets shot in the fucking back? Sorry, I'm, I'm calling bullshit. Then again, we are dealing with a hero who can get shot in the arm and yet moments later be completely healed. What the hell? Okay, I realize that this is Z-grade action here, all probably shot in one day, but you would think that at least one person on the set would have remembered that the fucking hero of the movie has been shot in the fucking arm. At the very least, the fucking makeup guy should have remembered that. 
On the flip side, though, we got a villain here who is so fucking brutal that he can slap the color right off of your robe. Harsh. So this marks an end to our week-long 50th review celebration of all things Pierre Kirby. And I think that makes Pierre Kirby the official movie star of the Cinema Snob. I don't know what the fuck ever happened to Pierre Kirby, but I am begging you, Mr. Kirby, wherever you are in this world, please come back and kick even more ass than you did in your record-setting ass-kicking year of 1988. In a world of once great movie franchises dumbing themselves down to a PG-13 level, your viewers need you. Those are the fuckers that got Pete. I'm gonna kill them, man. Those two are dead. Don't fuck up. Chuck, another actions ploitation. Just because I haven't done actions ploitation in a while doesn't mean I want to sit through it again. It's not like I crave something that I could instantly compare to a movie where a character named Jason Blade interrupts a guy in a chicken suit. So what do we have today? American Commando 3, Savage Temptation. Fantastic. I seem to recall something I said quite a while ago regarding movies with savage in the title. Anything with the word savage in it sucks. Savage Weekend, Savage Vengeance, Michael Savage, Savage Harvest. Well, Fred Savage is pretty good. And I'm sticking by that, too. Even though I have yet to watch this so-called Savage Temptation, I can already say that there is no chance that this movie will be entertaining. Watch out! Wait, what? It can't be. Oh my god! He's back. <laughs> That's right. Another Pierre Kirby movie. The gods have listened to me and beamed down this ultra-rare 1988 movie directly from the heavens for all of us who were praying for a return of the world's most obscure action hero. But how did this happen? Didn't I say many times during Pierre Kirby week that he only made six movies and there was no other listings after American Commando 2, Hunting Express? Well, I did say that, so let's answer these questions in another edition of Cinema Snob Mysteries. Yes, Cinema Snob Mysteries. That thing that I did once.
a year and a half ago. During Pierre Kirby week, I made the unfortunate mistake of basing the entire premise of reviewing each and every movie in Pierre Kirby's filmography on his IMDb page. While IMDb may be a great source for movie catalogization, let's face it, it is kind of a glorified Wikipedia. So when it comes to rare flicks, let's say from director Godfrey Ho, some of these movies don't even have a listing on IMDb, and that's the case with some of the movies in Pierre Kirby's filmography. A much better resource is to search Hong Kong film databases, and sometimes you'll come across plenty of movies from producer Joseph Lai and director Godfrey Ho that will not be found on our trusted IMDb. Christ, even Wikipedia one-upped IMDb with their entry on Night of the Ninja. Of course, I'm too much of a snob to admit that I fucked up. I fucked up. But truthfully, I don't know why this doesn't have an IMDb entry. It's not that rare. Look, I easily found it on VHS. Not sure how well this gun is gonna work. In fact, I think you have a better chance of killing yourself than your enemy. Or maybe the bullets ricocheted off themselves and came out the box right here. Or maybe not, because check this out. Exit wound, and if you flip it around, entry wound. That's how tough Pierre Kirby movies are. They can take a fucking bullet. Now, as per usual with the case of 80s Godfrey Ho movies, you've got two completely different movies that were spliced together to make one movie. One confusing movie. So what are we going to talk about first? Movie A or movie B? I know that the Godfrey Ho footage is usually considered to be movie B, since that footage was shot second and placed in pre-existing movies, and the Ho footage really only takes up about 30% of the movie. But no, the Godfrey Ho stuff is movie A in my book. Because Pierre Kirby is always top priority in these movies. I mean, look. He's on the fucking cover. Okay, so let's flip a coin and see what we get. Heads, it's movie A. Tails, it's movie B. Cock! Okay, let's start with movie B. B for... We start out in the opening credit sequence where we see some of the main characters testing out products they're about to sell the Daffy Duck. What's this now? Directed by Charles Lee? You're not fooling anyone, Godfrey! This movie mainly concerns a gang of hustlers run by a dirty old man named Chang, who owns a restaurant, and as we see here, he loves telling stories about his former prostitutes. Wow. Yeah. Lily was sexy. Oh. Man, nobody was sexier except for Betty Wong. Betty Wong? Is this movie getting its character names from Lawrence Tierney's Black Book and Reservoir Dogs? Chang is visited by his niece Nora and her... brother? I'm supposed to believe this 30-year-old has a 4-year-old brother? Well, she slaps him like he's her son, and she dresses him like a ventriloquist dummy. So this kid isn't gonna have issues with women at all when he grows up. Nora and her son brother move in with Chang, who instantly puts her to work with his gang of hustlers. Their big plan is to have Nora seduce powerful businessmen and politicians in bars where apparently Snoopy is doing the music. She lures each man into the hotel room with promises that she'll put out, or at least dance for them. Oui. Uh, merci. Uh. Uh. <laughs> You're French? Yeah, okay. She's about as French as Peter Sellers. The scheme comes into play when the gang rushes in and blackmails the businessmen by taking their picture. It'd probably be easier, though, if she just slept with them and they paid her money for it. It cuts out the middlemen. Most of the cock-teased businessmen give in to the blackmail. That makes this role of film valuable. <laughs> Copies to your employees and your wife. <laughs> the fuck? Was that a Japanese wah 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 I just heard? 
Does this box cover hint that that would happen in this movie? Nora takes to the nightlife a little bit, as we see here in this typical hooker walking down the seedy street in the 80s shot. No, oh, no, you're using the wrong music. Here, this'll make it much cooler. Hot child in the city Running wild and looking pretty Hot child in the city I mentioned that the movie gets zany, and I wasn't kidding. The bulk of this B story is a fucking slapstick comedy. The gang gets caught by Vice, and they get away in fucking fast motion. Seriously, it's one music cue away from this. Nora decides to break away from the prostitute who fucks people by stealing their money life and hooks up with a nerdy waiter, who she forms a romantic interest with. Nora, I'm not just making small talk. Please listen to me. I'm listening. So are you happy I'm moving in then? Huh? Wow! <laughs> Whoa! Yep, that's this character's gimmick. Falling over shit. You know, like the plot. And who the hell would hire this guy as a fucking waiter? Um, you want to see her? I... Uh, hey, get on with your work. Uh, <laughs> Jesus, this is less like a movie and more like a Japanese prank show. <laughs> Look at this, the guy even fights like he's Shemp Howard. Luckily, this guy is so wacky that he seems to get pitted up against even wackier villains. <laughs> Oh, good. Now he can prepare for his match against the Alley Gang from Toxic Avenger. <laughs> Nora goes through different odd jobs, as we see in this Seeking Employment montage. God, it's like I'm watching the first few minutes of Mannequin. The job that she lands is as a wedding dancer, which apparently in Japan, the stripper shows up at the wedding. What the hell, Harry Pitts? What the fuck? I had to pay extra for that at my bachelor party. I didn't know it could have come free with the wedding. Nora notices that her fellow dancers are on drugs, and she tries to rebel against her boss, making this movie feel an awful lot like I'm watching Girl in Gold Boots all of a sudden. Okay, so when it isn't zany, it's still kind of a thriller. Chang's gang wants revenge on Nora for... I don't know, her getting away when the leader tried raping her? They try killing her off at the end when they hide a fucking bomb in a cake. Ugh, I don't want that fucking cake. It's made of ticks. This part ends with a chase sequence as the characters try to make it home before the kid opens the cake. Once they get home, they dispose of the bomb the only way they know how. Adam West style. Some days you just can't get rid of a bomb. Though this movie ends a little differently than Batman the movie. <laughs> Enough with the fucking B movie. It's time for the feature presentation. Let's find out how all of this slapsticky romantic comedy gangland thriller ties in with a buddy cop movie. Who the hell sent you, Roland? What the hell? I am reviewing two completely different movies. I don't think I like the fact that Sean O'Dell's name is over Pierre Kirby's on the credits. Pierre Kirby comes second after no one.
You may have noticed a lot of green flickering in the movie footage, and I don't know what the deal with that is. So I'm just gonna chalk it up to the fact that Pierre Kirby's badassery is so fucking radioactive that it'll turn your fucking movie green. Pierre Kirby and Sean O'Dell are partners sent in to take down crime boss Roland. Sean O'Dell, you might remember as fucking Chuck McGunn here from American Commando 2 Hunting Express. In that movie, Odell was the hero and Kirby played the villain. But in this, American Commando 3, they're partners. I guess in 2, he ended up forgiving Pierre Kirby after he shot and killed him. But that's not the only thing wrong with this movie's title. Listen to their fucking voices. Do you think she knows what kind of man he is? I'm sure she doesn't. She's just a country girl. This is the first time she's been to the city. That's a nice, soothing British accent you have there, American Commando. So we've got a British guy playing a police officer, not a commando, in a sequel to a movie where they play two completely different characters. Oh, and I guess someone gets tempted savagely. After they get done looking at still shots from previous Godfrey Ho movies, it's time to take down Roland's gang. Wait a minute, I know this actor. What a useless guy. He's the useless guy! So I'm supposed to be afraid of someone who Pierre Kirby killed with one kick in Ninja Untouchables? Look at this guy. He's four foot nine. He looks like Jay Thomas. Even this fucking guy standing ten feet behind him looks two feet taller in scale. The guy next to him looks like he could easily just step on him. But it's not about the villain, it's about Pierre Kirby and Godfrey Ho style action, which this movie has plenty of. See? Guys in Transformers masks! Okay, I don't know if those are really Transformers masks, so let me make alternate versions of that comment in case I'm wrong. See? Guys in GoBots masks! <clears throat> okay, one more. See? Guys in masks referencing something cartoony from the 80s! And what's a buddy cop movie without the necessary scene of Pierre and Sean getting yelled at by the chief? Just give us a second chance. Second chance? This will be your only chance. Yes, your only chance. After your first chance. Making this your second chance. This movie also gives new meaning to characters who are terrible shots. <laughs> These villains are so awful that even the sounds of their guns are delayed! And that's nothing compared to this. No! It's one thing to have your characters miss, but it's another to have the camera perfectly lined up with their shot, yet they still miss. There's still plenty of great Pierre Kirby moments in this movie, especially some nods to other Pierre Kirby movies. You know what that means? What? We gotta put him behind bars. Fast! I'm sorry, did you say... fast? Fast. Ted Fast. Nice. And the dubbing here is something special, too. In this scene, they seem to partner a guy with a voice that's too high with a guy whose voice is too low. I won this at the fair the other day. I thought your kid might like it. Thanks, that's real nice of you. I'm sure he'll like it. Good thing Pierre Kirby's voice shows up, which sounds just right. You bastards using a child's toy to conceal your drugs. Pierre Kirby even decides to fight the nerdy character, which looks like Eric Bana fighting Eddie Deason. You better just drop that and come with me quietly. No way, pig. You ain't taking me in. Go on, use your gun, pig. I don't need a gun to handle you. Dude, you don't even need your arms for this fight. You may be wondering how this ties in with, you know, this. Oh, that's easy! Roland's gang keeps attempting to recruit the head of Chang's gang, and even gives him the order to kill Nora, who Pierre Kirby tries to protect in this scene. Listen, Nora, we're still friends. If you need anything, get in touch with me. Protect to the extent that he can, seeing how they're both in two completely different rooms, 
in two completely different countries. The film ends with the classic Godfrey Ho style action confrontation, beginning with music that I'm totally sure Ho bought the rights for. <laughs> That's pretty badass. All right, I'm here. Okay. No way, Roland. No way? No way to what? All he said was okay. Are you saying no way to his passive aggressiveness? The gunfight continues with Pierre Kirby squaring off against Roland's Japanese stunt double, and there's even an intense part here where Roland gets a hold of the gun. I don't know what to make of Pierre Kirby's face here. It's like he's thinking to himself, Oh shit, I really hope Godfrey was smart enough to put blanks in this gun. But luckily he's saved by Sean O'Dell, paving the way for the buddy cop movie handshake. Partner. Got him. And there you have American Commando 3, Savage Temptation. In my searches, I've come across two other Pierre Kirby movies. One called Crackdown Mission, and one which I don't have called Dress to Fire. That makes nine movies so far in the Pierre Kirby filmography. And who knows? These movies are so undocumented that there could be more out there. It's a huge possibility. Now you may be wondering why I, a cinema snob, am so complimentary towards non-John Wayne action hero Pierre Kirby. Well, I think that cinema snobs and other people could agree that Pierre Kirby could kick my ass. And he's pretty fucking awesome. Even cinema snobs have their guilty pleasures. Cancer? 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 <laughs> Cancer? These are my favorite weeks of the year, when I get to sit back and actually enjoy an otherwise terrible movie. How could I not enjoy it? Hello, Pierre Kirby kicking loads amounts of 80s action exploitation ass in a paper-thin plot that's clumsily spliced into another movie? Sounds exactly like something that's up a cinema snob's alley. Hey, it is when it has Pierre Kirby in it. Like American Commando 3 Savage Temptation, this is one of the un imd would entries of Pierre's filmography, one that I missed while doing Pierre Kirby Week. Truth be told though, I actually did come across this movie when doing my research for that week. The Pierre Kirby movies all have about five or six alternate titles attached to them, and in the case of Dress to Fire, that's what I thought happened. I thought it was an alternate title to another Pierre Kirby movie. How could I have carelessly thought that? Because the back of the box has still shots from American Commando 2 Hunting Express. Look, there's Sean O'Dell doing his Keith Coogan face again. And what makes it even worse is that Sean O'Dell is not in Dress to Fire. So after seeing the trailer for this film, it quickly dawned on me that not only is this a different Pierre Kirby movie altogether, but that the distributor, Videotech, only wanted to sabotage Pierre Kirby week. Interesting side note here. This box cover was sold in an auction that was selling only the cover and another movie. Yeah, see for yourself. 39 steps? What? Never thought I'd say this, but sorry, Alfred Hitchcock, I've got a Godfrey Ho movie to watch. Funny how the box cover features stills from the wrong movie, and the movie in the box is neither of those movies. Ah yes, classic Godfrey Ho style opening scene, slowly driving away from the VHS static, suspenseful as hell. Wait, what? American Commando 4, dressed to fire? Yeah, I'm sure this follows in perfect continuity with the villainous Pierre Kirby movie, the buddy cop Pierre Kirby movie, and this non-Pierre Kirby movie, which I'm sure is good since it looks like it was delivered to us by angels? 
It's got another alternate title, which is Advent Commando 3, Dress to Fire. It's part 3 instead of part 4, since they took out Savage Temptation. Well, don't do that. That'll just make everything confusing. Well, you gotta expect things to get a little clusterfucked when it's based on a story by AAV Creative Unit. Sounds like a script bot from Futurama. This is the movie's villain, Lamar, and... what? Solomon? All alone today, huh, Solomon? Who the hell are you? Ted Fast? Of course Solomon is the villain here. But in case you haven't figured out that he's the bad guy, just wait for the sinister 80s villain stinger. We're just in time, too, because we've caught Lamar during target practice. He really wishes he had the exploding tree gun from Rollerball. Never mind that, though, because he's got some serious antagonistic work to be doing. Huh. Fear Kirby looks a little feminine in this movie. Oh wait, never mind, it's Mr. B Natural. So Mr. B wants out of the prostitution business, where she seriously cornered the market for those with a Mary Martin fetish. Instead of letting her go, Lamar decides to kill her, which jokes on him when she returns as Catwoman. I don't know though, I'm not sensing the Solomon-style anger that was felt in his performance in Thunder of the Gigantic Serpent. He should add a little something extra to the end of his lines. And if she fights back, then the world will have one less bitch on heat to deal with. <laughs> <laughs> now it's perfect! The Solomon laugh. <laughs> Think of the power I will have! Ha! Unfortunately for him, though, that girl had a boyfriend named Nick. A man known to be sort of a badass, who just so happens to be good with weapons. Can we see the grand entrance, please? What the hell? Where's my squee sound? God damn it. Perfect. A fart joke. It's now up to Pierre Kirby to chop and shoot his way through miscellaneous henchmen and spout off those Kirby one-liners we've all come to know and love. And he's dead? What are you talking about? You'll never get an Academy Award with a line like that, James. <laughs> you know, at this point, I think Pierre Kirby has earned the right to also make fun of the movie. Lamar continues with business as usual, and I know that this movie doesn't follow any of the action of the previous American Commando movies, but 15 minutes in, this is starting to feel like a movie where I did miss previous installments. Now what's happening with Robert? Has he settled the score with Mandy yet? I don't know who these people are! Well, Mandy's friend Raymond is in the way. I thought Robert sent Simon to take care of him. Fuck, I don't know who they are either! This is like going to a class of 85 reunion when you graduated in 96. But once Pierre fucks up one of Lamar's drug deals, Lamar sends Eric Stoltz and his best men to take him out. As if those guys wouldn't have already been wandering aimlessly in the woods, waiting for Pierre Kirby to kill them, regardless of who sent them. <laughs> Where did he duck off to? Look at that! Where did he go that made it impossible for this henchman to see him? I'm assuming he just teleported across the forest. It's Pierre Kirby! I'll buy it that he has magical powers. And you better believe that those magical powers involve Godfrey Ho's trademark tuck and roll maneuver. A fight like this, though, is rather easy when one of the villains has never fired a gun before. Eventually, Pierre happens upon a big exchange between Lamar and... Holy shit, fucking General Karpov? Good idea. Of course we have to get rid of him, idiot. General Karpov and Solomon in the same scene together. You don't understand. This is the Godfrey Ho equivalent of Blofeld having a conversation with Goldfinger. 
Although, since this is only an hour and four minutes into the movie, Pierre can't kill the main villains yet. He's still got henchmen to attend to. That's right. It shoots. But what it cuts to shortly after, I can barely even explain. No, really. I'm kind of at a loss. It's something I never thought I would see in one of these movies. You want to see it? You want to see Dress to Fire get all dramatic? Well, here it is. Pierre Kirby crying. <laughs> Look at me, you'll find no jokes here. fully equipped to take out his revenge on Lamar. And what would a Godfrey Ho finale be like without cigarettes and lifted music? Pierre and Lamar have their one-on-one, -on -one, and in an 80s action movie, a stab to the balls is equally as fatal as a stab to the heart. Nothing left to do after that, but walk off into the sunset. Now, since this is a Godfrey Ho film, yes, there is another movie that all of this footage is spliced into. But do we really care, though? Okay, fine. What's this other movie about? Movie B features a character named Alan, whose friends and family are constantly harassed by a local crime organization. Huh? Don't ask questions! Pay it, butter! <laughs> A little hard to take this seriously when the mobster sounds like Jerry Lewis. You're a fool. You're gonna be really sorry for this. I'll kill you. <laughs> As if you couldn't guess, these gangsters are under the leadership of Lamar, who gracefully edits himself in with the other characters. Most of these guys just roam the streets beating up random people. <laughs> Charlie Chan, you watch it. Charlie Chan? Well, at least he's played by an Asian guy this time. Even the prostitutes are in on this shit. Don't worry, though. This guy was saved by the fact that the full-screen ratio decapitated her. Alan ends up saving a friend of his, which causes the gang to strike against Alan. You know, shooting him could have worked, but if butcher knife wielding street toughs is your thing, so be it. After being impressed by Alan's fighting skills, the gangsters hire him to be their bodyguard, which he accepts, seen here making sure the music doesn't get too suspicious. Pierre Kirby pops in to remind us that he's in this movie too, and I'll admit, at least they tried matching backgrounds here. Not only do we see someone standing in for the woman from movie B, but the lighting from that footage looks like it's reflecting off of Pierre's face. Quite a step up from the pool cover background in Full Metal Ninja, or even later in this film, when a bar scene is matched with a sleeping bag hanging up behind Lamar. But when the father of Alan's love interest owes money to the gangsters, Alan does what he can to protect all of them from Lamar's men. <laughs> And I guess he's also protecting them from the musical threat that the Toxic Avenger will show up at any minute. The gangsters then become responsible for the death of Alan's mom, which only pisses him off even more. You'll be able to apologize to my mother. <laughs> Holy shit, he just punched the end off of that sentence. And there's a villain in this section who tries to match the evil Solomon Lamar laugh, but... <laughs> Come on, don't be frightened. I'll be very gentle with you, my darling. <laughs> I will admit, though, that this scene is useful for the funniest cut in the film. Oh. 
Either he fucked her with a bolt of lightning, or he's a superhero, and that's his scene transition. So much shit is happening to Alan, you'd think it'd call for a revenge-seeking montage. Huh, is that a montage I sense coming? Oh no, it's just a dweeby guy walking across the street. I miss Pierre Kirby already. But whatever. Let's get to the heartwarming brother-sister reunion. <laughs> I did always say that the movies I review should be a little more Kubrickian. But seriously, Clockwork Orange music? Yeah, great that this tender moment shares the same music as a scene that showed Alex DeLarge storing items that he stole off of people who he raped. Not that this tender moment lasts long anyway. The love interest is killed off with a picket fence. Now Alan has to track down those responsible for killing his girlfriend. Congratulations, Movie B. It's taken you an hour and 18 minutes, but your plot is finally identical to the Pierre Kirby plot. All right, let's check out the showdown. That's the music from the Ted Fast vs. Solomon fight from the end of Gigantic Serpent. How dare they steal music from that? Even though it's actually just a sped up version of Neverland by Sisters of Mercy. Sorry, I just like that this Godfrey Ho movie lifted music from another Godfrey Ho movie that was lifted off of something completely unrelated. All this fighting Alan is faced with, I sure hope that a random character from earlier in the movie shows up for no reason. Alan! What are you doing here? To help you get these batches, what do you think? Right! Perfect! Now that plot is settled. Uh, yawn, yawn. Uh, so sleepy. I don't care about anything in that story. And neither does this fucking box cover. Pierre Kirby graces the cover, for one, and the paragraph describing Pierre Kirby's plot is over twice as long as the paragraph describing Alan's plot. Which is funny in that the Alan story takes up about 85% of the movie's running time. Truth be told, Dress to Fire is not a good introduction to the greatness of Pierre Kirby. Pierre is probably only in about 10 minutes worth of screen time in this, and in all the others, yeah, the Godfrey Ho footage most always takes up less space than the archive footage, but the Ho scenes are usually spread out in a good consistency throughout the movie. In Dress to Fire, Pierre Kirby comes in about 20 minutes in, and then it'll cut to other stuff for about 45 minutes minutes before cutting back to him. This movie does have balls for assuming that I'd want to see anything else in it other than Pierre Kirby, but like the finale of the film, those balls should be stabbed. Twice. You know you'll never defeat me. Three months, fool. 